The subject today looks like a laundry list, liturgies of life in its cycles, blessing, covenanting, healing, reconciling, dying, remembering. I come to the subject in a second, but want to open, in a sense, acknowledging the theme, liturgies of life, uh, by uh, praying in a way that many Christians do, all Christians really do, uh, every day, hopefully, namely extemporaneously, without a book uh, and a prescribed text. So let us enter into a moment of prayer. Holy God, you are the mystery at the heart of the universe, the mystery at the heart of our own lives. We give you thanks that you've accompanied everything you've created since the beginning of time on its journey through life. We give you thanks that you have accompanied each of us on our journeys. We give thanks for this moment in our lives, a moment to learn, to understand more deeply your ways with your people. Grant us clarity and focus and openness to the mysteries of the ways in which you accompany our journey through life. And at the end of our own time, grant us mercy and receive us into your eternal dwelling place. We pray in the name of all that is holy. Amen. Before we move into the subject uh, for the day, I need to add an addendum to the last lecture on the Eucharist. You will recall that we spent two sessions looking at key uh, Christian rituals that are considered sacraments, ordinances in almost all Christian communities of faith. The last one was on Eucharist, the one before on baptism. I realized after the lecture on the Eucharist that I had failed to talk about a crucial point. I always end up having more material than I fit in, but I think last time I missed a crucial point. So I wanted to uh, stress that uh, point. It is the question related to what many of you will know uh, as the moment of consecration. In other words, the question of when does ordinary bread and wine that we bring into the gathered assembly turn into something more than ordinary or different than ordinary bread and wine. Uh, connected to that question for many, many centuries in the Western Church is the so-called institution narrative namely a recitation over bread and wine of the words that Jesus himself spoke at the Last Supper. In the Eucharistic prayer, also known as the canon, uh, from the Greek canon, it has nothing to do with the military term, the canon of uh, the Roman Mass, this recitation of the words of institution, this is my body, became a kind of key moment where theologians were able to locate, or thought they were able to locate precisely the moment when the bread and the wine 
became something else than only bread and wine. And in fact, the reformers, the Protestant reformers, that is, of the 16th century, continued that thinking in a very stark way, in the sense that they made the uh, recitation of the words of institution, the, the recitation of a biblical warrant for why we are doing what we are doing, uh, the focal point of what was said over bread and wine. But an earlier understanding, an Eastern understanding, and an understanding that we have entered into again uh, today, I think, is that we think of what consecrates what makes ordinary bread and wine different is not the, the moment of reciting the words of institution, but the whole prayer of thanksgiving. We hallow by thanksgiving over uh, bread and wine. And as if to illustrate that, um, uh, scholars now think that, at least in some traditions, the recitation of the words of institution uh, come into what was said over bread and wine quite late, and by that I mean the fourth century. And there are, in fact, Eucharistic prayers, ancient ones, um, prior that, that we have from prior to the fourth century that never included words of institution. And in Eastern traditions, I think I did mention that if pressed, um, especially by Westerners, where, where is the moment of consecration, what consecrates, the pointer typically would be to the epiclesis, the spirit. It's the moment the spirit is called upon to consecrate that consecrates. But more broadly understood, most scholars, I think, would now say it's, it's the whole of the prayer. You cannot identify one element um, only. Um, especially not the words of institution, which are latecomers, let's say, in praying over bread and wine. And by latecomers, I know I'm looking at the long trajectory from the beginning and saying the fourth century is late for, for this. We have evidence of earlier praying without the words of institution. Okay. So just an invitation to think Eucharistic consecration beyond this fixation of the words of institution. Now, back to the subject at hand. We covered basics of two foundational sacraments, baptism and Eucharist, and today we continue with some other rites, rituals, that have sacramental valence and in some traditions are counted as sacraments. Hidden behind the rather vague terminology of the title and the laundry list, uh, there are these rituals I want to talk about today. They share a fundamental characteristic, and it is this, that they are related to specific events in a believer's life. Events which over the church's uh, journey through time 
the church is marked with a Christian vision for these events, but the events themselves are not Christian specials as such that drop from heaven with Jesus and nobody else has ever celebrated them before. Think particularly of um, weddings and also funerals. In other words, rituals around dying and death. These events in a person's life have over centuries, millennia before uh, the Christian faith emerges or the Jewish faith emerged, been ritualized in, in communities, human communities. So what happens in a Christian context is that these life events, major life events, uh, come to be imprinted uh, with, within an overarching vision of life inspired by, sustained by Christian faith. I'll talk about rituals of dying and death separately in the next session because it's a perfect example in a sense of what I've just said, and it deserves more attention than it usually gets, I think. So I leave that aside and talk on the other uh, rituals um, for uh, today. Um, a footnote, just a thought, maybe these life events that have become ritualized in a strong Christian, with a strong Christian stamp over time, are peculiarly important for the life of the church today uh, for two reasons, uh, maybe three. In contemporary Western culture, at least these life cycle liturgies, for lack of a better word, seem to bring people to church more than most other worship services, weddings in particular. Um, they're also, if you look into broader cultural developments, you see, at least when you look with the eyes of a scholar of liturgy and ritual, you see an amazing um, interest in and hunger for um, rituals of all sorts. I just read an uh, article uh, on someone whose life work has become creating meaningful, whatever that means, um, elder rituals. So a ritual for people to hand over their car keys and promise to stop driving. The ritual of <laughs> moving from a home to a care facility. Uh, the ritual of writing a legacy letter. I didn't even know what that was. Um, Christians have been writing testaments of their faith for centuries, but I guess that has morphed in a secular society, secular rising society into legacy letters and a host of other ways of ritualizing. Um, there are institutional organizations now that uh, create for good money for your institution rituals um, to enable people to be together in a structured, ritualized environment. Okay, so uh, end of footnote, uh, in a sense. Um, back to the subject at hand. One way to group these rituals, as I said, is to think of life cycle liturgies, uh, 
Uh, other terminologies you will encounter might be pastoral offices, pastoral liturgies, or Ruth Duck rites of the church, uh, meaning for her, I think, um, the church um, at some point decided to ritualize these in a particular way without there being a, a biblical command to do these. So we can or we cannot uh, ritualize them. Now, in order to dig a bit deeper into these um, life cycle liturgies, a bit of ritual theory is actually helpful. A reminder here of the introductory, back to the introductory session, ritual studies emerges next to liturgical studies and worship studies um, in, the, in the 20th century, really, with a, a focus on uh, an interest in rituals and a total disinterest in theological tools of analysis. So this has produced some interesting theorizing and has fed back in its theorizing into liturgical studies as one methodology we use, uh, particularly helpful when it comes to life cycle liturgies, to dig deeper into the ritual structure of these events. Some notes on the understanding of ritual in ritual studies. In some ways, the problem in ritual studies is that almost everything in life is ritualized. The way I get to my first cup of coffee in the morning is highly ritualized. So the, you have a problem of definition. What is not a ritual? The way we begin class, we gather. I remind you to wear masks. We open with prayer. It's, you could interpret this as a ritual. Now, how do we get to a better understanding of ritual than everything is ritual? Uh, first, usually in ritual theory, uh, ritual means a patterned stylized, repeatable action. It is often linked with transition points in life or in a day, or in a calendar. Uh, so we have specific uh, calendar rites. They are often culturally specific. Think of uh, July 4th in the US. In my culture of origin, that's a simple, normal day. Nobody fusses over anything. Um, Thanksgiving Day in the US. Uh, third, typically rituals involve symbolic actions. They are not simply verbal moments. The opening of class is you walk in and choose your seat. Although the way you all have ritualized this, I think you don't choose a seat. You just know which you think is your seat. I know which is mine back here. So, um, often fourth rituals are rooted in the past, and in your case with choosing your seats, well, the past is that you've chosen it for the last seven sessions, and this is an authorizing past for you. You gravitate towards that seat. It has worked for you. For the last few sessions, assumption is, that's my seat. Um, 
even if rituals, and this is still under the same point, with their rooting in the past seem to quickly become immutable, there is usually quite a bit of elasticity in them and that points they can be invented and reinvented. Um, fifth, uh, rituals are always uh, evolving and emerging. They might look stable, uh, but they are actually on, the, on a move through time as we are as human beings. And sixth, ju this is just a cautionary note really, um, with all the interest in um, the use of rituals and inventing rituals in contemporary culture, we should never forget that rituals have manipulative powers and can easily be put to the service of all kinds of ideologies. Um, two examples come to mind, one from my own culture of origin. Um, the Nazis had a very elaborate and sophisticated ritual machine, understanding of how to construct rituals. And it was deeply manipulative. And death dealing, ritual can have that power. Um, not quite as, as stark, but equally differently remarkable is um, the image from January 6th of the, sh the shaman. Well, that's, that, that's a ritual practice. They are hearkening back to of an ancient, seemingly ancient form of ritualizing. Um, the other um, ritualizing that the news media mostly didn't show was the um, um, presence, and it was definitely there, of Christian moments of prayer before the storming of the capital. So just a cautionary note that ritual is not always about um, something either innocent or wonderful. It is open to the breadth of human uh, depravity as it is open to the breadth of human joys and celebration. Now, a return to Christian worship and its particular life cycle rituals. What makes these life cycle rituals um, Christian is a unique theological claim rooted in Christian faith, namely that these rituals render visible God's journey with human beings on the pilgrimage of life. Uh, toward an ultimate fulfillment of all things in God's own redeeming and life-giving presence. So that's, it's a theological stamp, in a sense, that is put on broader human ritualizing uh, that makes them unique. Who has encountered the term rites of passage before? Ah, great. Okay, um, rites of passage uh, became one of these key words in, uh, actually stood at the beginning of the development of ritual uh, uh, theory and ritual studies in the 20th uh, century. Um, uh, it goes back to an anthropologist, ethnographer, um, 
who wrote a book with that name at the beginning of um, the 20th uh, century. And his key insight when he looked at rites of passage outside of a Christian context, that was not his interest, um, was to notice that these were specific ritual events that transition a person from one status in life to another. So think of um, rituals, and he was looking at non-Western uh, non societies. Uh, think of ceremony, ceremonies uh, surrounding puberty, coming of age especially in traditional societies where that's an important marker and is marked ritually. We still mark it ritually. You just have to read between lines. Uh, of, and we typically don't mark it ritually in a Christian context unless you, you pull in confirmation and plop it onto that uh, uh, moment and make a rite of passage for it um, uh, surrounding puberty. But in, secular, in a secularizing context, there are other rites. Uh, in the US, think of getting a driver's license that mark a change of status uh, so around moments of puberty. Um, the, the key example, of course, is marriage. Um, a, a, a rite of transition typically marked ritually, uh, not just in a one hour uh, ritual, but in a longer um, ritual journey. Let's say from engagement to all these parties that precede a wedding, to a wedding, to what do you add in now, a honeymoon, this, that, and the other. A, a clear a rite of passage in terms of um, a, a ritual uh, structure. And then especially rituals uh, surrounding dying and death. Although, as we will discover next week, in, in, again in this context, that ritual journey has been shrunk uh, yeah, I won't say any more, or I'll get off script. Um, typically, um, we think of three distinct phases in rites of uh, passage: uh, uh, rituals of transition, uh, rituals of separation from the previous status. A key threshold right in which you um, jump across the dividing line. <coughs> Let's say between not married and married, the key threshold right is either the wedding or if you want to go more narrowly, the moment of, um, in which you express consent and are then declared. Uh, married, so that the key moment that changes your status in rituals of dying and death, it's the moment in which you die or are declared dead. And then uh, post-liminal rites, rites of incorporation in which you um, begin to inhabit your new status. I'm making this up as I go along. Um, think of the first dance of the couple at the party after the wedding, I think, in the US. That's a big sort of moment after the wedding that celebrates the new status. OK, you get the picture. You can color in the, these, the details. Um, OK. Now, uh, 
I think it's easy to see why these uh, basic theories of ritualizing really caught on. Um, they have legs. You can read uh, lots of things you do in life with that kind of patterning. Um, so as you exit from class today, think of it as the post-liminal, right? Um, you're, you're entering your new status of now having completed session number, what is it, eight? in Foundations of Christian Worship. So you can spin this out. Um, let me simply leave it at that. More, Lots more could be said of rites of passage. But I think we have enough there to, to work with. Um, why is this category useful for understanding uh, the, the deep structure of Christian life cycle liturgies. Well, in part because these life cycle liturgies have an anthropological starting point. They begin with a life event, a human life event, to people covenant to be married. Someone dies. And one way to think about these liturgies in a Christian context is to think of them as a fourth liturgical cycle of time to the three we will be talking about later when we look at cycles of time in Christian liturgy. I'll argue there are essentially three um, it's a daily cycle, it's a weekly cycle, with a Sunday as its um, hinge point, and it's a yearly cycle that is patterned in particular ways. Now, in a sense, with life cycle lit liturgies, we have a fourth cycle whose time frame is configured by the life cycle of individuals. and is grafted onto the three basic liturgical rhythms of time. And this fourth cycle is rooted in the simple fact that the Christian community of faith is made up of human beings, each of whom has its own, has their own life cycle. Now the trick with the life cycles and liturgical responses to life cycles is that sometimes your life cycle bites the established liturgical cycles you're woven into. Um, the very simple example is for me having a birthday um, at a point in the liturgical cycles when we sometimes have Good Friday fall on my birthday. That sucks because <laughs> as, I mean it doesn't happen every year, so sometimes my birthday falls on Easter, yay! But on Good Friday, that's not the day when a scholar of liturgy can throw a birthday party. It's traditionally a, way, a day of fasting. Uh, so, life cycle, that's a humorous example. There are much worse examples. But that's a humorous example of how a life cycle can wreck, or no, it's not the life cycle that wrecks, it's the liturgical cycle <laughs> that wrecks your, your birthday party. So. Um, on a more uh, important note, in a sense, um, we do, as Christians, take seriously enough 
rhythms of our own lives, in which, after all, our faith always has to be embodied, um, to, to celebrate or mark some of these events with Christian worship services. Funerals may be the best example, uh, but there are others, and some of them I will not even touch on uh, today, but just to put them on the um, screen for you, uh, think of people making religious vows, for example, in monastic communities. That's ritualized, and it's a rite of passage. You leave behind the words, so to speak, you make a commitment to a monastic community and you then are able to wear a monastic robe of a particular kind. Um, think of liturgies um, that have begun to be developed around stillbirth that mark that particular um, dramatic moment with a stamp of faith. Or think of very new emerging rituals, the blessing of a trans person who is choosing a new name. There are rituals out there. And I mean Christian rituals now. There are lots of rituals out there. But th there are also decidedly Christian rituals out there for that. Again, a reminder, some churches consider some of these life cycle liturgies uh, sacraments, in my own tradition, uh, confirmation, healing of the sick, reconciliation of sinners, blessings of those seeking to live a married life, setting apart some people for ordained ministry. But whether your own faith community considers these life cycle liturgies as sacraments, that's a technicality, or not, they usually are celebrated, marked in a worship service. And they have specific ritual actions within them. So let's look at some of them, because they are quite different uh, in, in more detail. I'll do the reverse of what Ruth Duck does, so where she is um, very detailed, I'll be less detailed, where she's not that detailed, I'll add in some things. Um, the first to flag, um, and I don't want to spend much time on that because we've dealt with it already, is confirmation. Now, remember, this is really originates as one small element towards the end of baptismal initiation. It's the rite, at least in the Church of Rome, of a second anointing post-baptism, after baptism, an anointing reserved for the bishop to do. What happens is that this element of baptismal initiation splits off, becomes its own separate ritual, and latches on to a particular moment in human developmental history, namely mostly puberty. And attached to it comes another element in uh, baptismal in initiation, depending on which tradition you are in, it's, uh, it comes either very early or quite late. It's the personal profession of faith that latches on to confirmation as a separate rite. And as I said, it all comes to be connected to in human developmental terms, uh, the moment of puberty. Um, hmm. This could make one very, should make one very critical of this 
write, at least if you are nothing but a scholar of liturgy and don't have pastoral responsibilities. So I'm not saying to any of you, march into parishes you might serve and try and abolish uh, the right of confirmation because it's such a mess historically and, and ritually. I'm just saying it's good to know the history to understand the complexity of this uh, uh, ritual. Uh, remember, Ruth Duck has this funny story about um, a pastor who has a, a bat infestation in in their church and doesn't know how to get rid of it and then the bats disappear and his response to how he did that was that he confirmed them. It's a ritual of leaving uh, by now, although of course that's not its intention, but it often functions like that. Okay, a second um, rite of pa passage in a sense, in some churches considered a sacrament, is uh, the, the right of confession of sins and reconciliation. Uh, this is covered quite a bit in by Duck, especially in terms of uh, pastoral guidance regarding reconciliation. I'm less interested in that. I'm more interested in um, the ritual pattern that the patterns that develop over time out of a clearly attested New Testament practice. And in fact, one that Jesus commanded his followers to do. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained, John 20. And then uh, in James, so in, in one of the later uh, letters, uh, the invitation to confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. So there is a clear path in the New Testament, not path, a clear warrant in the New Testament already for this journey of reconciling sinners. But the history over 2,000 years of how this comes to be ritualized is exceedingly um, complex. And uh, developed uh, quite differently in different ecclesial communities also. Just one little example that uh, typically isn't on the radar screen of people who write about the history of the, the, this ritual development. In um, monastic uh, uh, communities of women in the 5th and 6th century in Europe, um, confession of sin happened to the abbess, and she also absolved. So later on there, well, even earlier, um, the, the thinking comes to be that you confess to a priest. But that's not historically not, not always the case. And in fact, it could be in the hands um, of, of women. And if I'm not mistaken, Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas, um, uh, also is convinced that in extremis, if, if you are um, facing death, you, you can confess to anybody. Um, and of course, always to God directly. Um, but the reassurance of, um, of um, absolution uh, typically doesn't come in the form of a vision and you hearing a voice from heaven, but through human beings. Um, yes, to map uh, maybe some of this on to a rite of passage, uh, in the Middle Ages, um, theologians develop a sort of uh, map 
for a journey from having sinned to being reconciled? What needs to be a part of that journey? And there are three or sometimes four um, key elements that belong. Uh, the first one is contrition. The, it, really, that is the, the insight that what you have done is a sin. That is not nothing. In our culture especially, think how sin has come to be recoded. This is sinfully delicious. You know, a dessert. Or women uh, are told that they've committed a hair sin. Right? I mean, the understanding of sin is just not very robust. So the first uh, of these elements, I guess that's a footnote. Um, I don't want to get off on my hobby horse here. Um, but the, the, this first point is actually not unimportant, that you decipher something you have done as a sin, and that's a theological category. It's not, oops, I ate more dessert than I should have. Who cares? Um, it, it's the insight that something you have done is, is a sin against God and against or another human being or against creation. Um, that's, a, that's a theological insight already. Second confession, you speak that you acknowledge that sin. Absolution, a pronouncement of forgiveness. And then something that is variously described as penance or um, satisfaction but the Latin satisfactio means something specific in the context of um, confession and absolution, namely that you make restitution for as much as you can for what you have done wrong. So if you have stolen someone's laptop this wasn't a problem in the Middle Ages. <laughs> <laughs> you return it. Okay. Yes, misuses grew around the sacrament, and it, in fact, becomes a key uh, point uh, in uh, uh, the Reformation. Dr. Seger will tell you more about that. Uh, Luther counted reconciliation as a sacrament for many years. because there was biblical evidence for this being a sacrament. Um, in the end, the ritual as such it, um, isn't counted as a sacrament, but of course the actions of confessing one's sin uh, and um, being forgiven are deeply imprinted into, especially, especially the Reformed churches. Okay, a quick look at our own times and several things worth considering, I think. I already flagged one of them that in terms of cultural context, I think Christians would first need to render understandable what we mean by sin before we throw the word around because it has become its meaning has become dissolved in contemporary uh, culture. And quite honestly, I don't think human sinfulness is intelligible and real outside of a God-sustained narrative and vision of the cosmos. Second, many churches who might not consider um, 
confession and absolution a sacrament technically do of course have forms of communal confession and absolution. That is a, a, an acknowledgement of sins in worship and a pronouncement of forgiveness. I think the Methodists, at least when I moved in Methodist circles, we have Methodists here, a couple, yeah, um, had an intriguing sort of twist on this, a pronouncement of forgiveness where a minister says, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven, and then the congregation <coughs> pronounces forgiveness to the minister, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. So, uh, forgiveness as an equal opportunity employer, uh, it's not a bad idea. Um, third, I simply want to flag the emergence of secular sites of confessions, including online confessionals. So my narrative here is that there seems to be a, a need culturally for practices of confession, although ecclesial practices of confession have declined uh, rapidly. What's interesting if one tries to map these secular uh, rites or sites of confession is that um, they are largely unmoored from any Christian roots but carry sometimes even visual vestiges of a Christian past and they thrive in digitally mediated social space. Apparently, con our contemporaries do have much to confess and appreciate sites, particularly online sites, that make this possible. We do live in an age of digital oversharing, after all. So there is now a plethora, if anybody wants to study this, um, uh, there is a plethora of secular choreographies of confession uh, that have emerged. On the low end of this art is uh, carefully scripted public apologies, uh, particularly of politicians, and a website that analyzes those, uh, to an abundance of confessional memoirs, uh, reality TV confessions and to just lift up one some of you might have made use of this who knows what post secret is great um, it began as an offline community art project in 2005 I think but by now is uh, has an online existence so the creator of this uh, offline art project invited people to mail in their confessions written anonymously on the side of on a postcard and this became wildly successful spawning a number of books um, a, a community the post secret community and now website um, an app and so on and so forth the idea here was um, that a person could confess and there were only two prerequisites. You had to confess something that you've never confessed be to before and it had to be anonymous. So you cannot, you don't sign your name. The project was overwhelmed with submissions. Some of them funny, some of them heart-wrenching. I started my friend on heroin. <laughs> 
I stole a piece of cheese. Okay, you know, not major. By starting your friend on heroin, that's big. Um, I could multiply um, these uh, on, uh, websites uh, for practices of confession. They are out there, um, especially apps for confessions have become quite popular. Um, there are workshops offered now for forgiveness training as pathways to, and I quote, the healing powers and medical benefits of forgiveness has nothing to do with Christian faith. These are secularizing practices of what used to be at this Christian ritual of confession of sins and forgiveness. Okay. Mm. I have some very deep thoughts on uh, why this confessional of the media has become so important in our times in contradistinction to the confessional of churches. But I think I'm going to spare you those wonderful details. Uh, maybe if there is time, I can come back to it. It basically has to do, my narrative would have to do with the instabilities that a, a postmodern self uh, 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 experiences. And um, digitally mediated confessions outside of a Christian context um, al allow you to explore the problematic edges of yourself. Um, okay. Mm, mm, I have another interesting footnote. Let me see how much else I have. Yeah, okay, I'm going to skip this other interesting footnote. <laughs> Has to do with the sacrament of reconciliation and the pandemic. Um, because that inflected issues of um, how do you pronounce forgiveness in digital, in, in social distance and across digital media in a Christian context. Okay. Third, anointing of the sick, healing, and wholeness. Again, this is long in Ruth Duck. I'll keep it short here. Again, this is clearly attested in the New Testament and in the practice of Jesus and commanded by Jesus um, to his followers. And again, in the letter uh, of James, it's clear that there is already a ritual process in the, this, in James's early Christian community. And the ritual process is this. You are sick. You call the elders of the church to pray over you and to anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord. And prayer in faith will make the sick person well. Connected to this um, anointing of the sick is a broad notion of healing. Uh, James continues, if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. And then, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. So there might have been a moment of confession of sins um, woven into this, the healing ritual, the ritual of anointing in this particular community. Again, forms of healing continue to be practiced in ecclesial communities throughout times. They can take very different forms um, and um, you also continue to see throughout history um, practices of healing that are, how shall I say, charismatic, that are not ritualized in a worship service but are actions um, particularly linked to holy persons who have the power to heal someone. Hildegard of Bingen is, is a case of point. There, uh, case in point, there are many, many others. I want to add in here something that mm, certainly in the, in the West uh, 
we we almost we don't even hide it. We've forgotten it exists. Um, it's um, what might be called ministries of deliverance, aka exorcisms. Again, this is clearly attested in the New Testament and in the practice of Jesus and commanded to his followers. And it continues to be a ministry in the church in some cultural contexts, Africa, um, parts of Latin America, it's very important still. Um, and uh, of course, in charismatic communities, it uh, continues to be practiced. I don't have much experience uh, with this, but I at least want to name it. Um, I don't think hiding it is, uh, is truthful to uh, the New Testament witness. Um, so, period. Mm. Marriage is covered in duck, in Ruth duck. Um, just a reminder, this is very clearly a ritual of a rite of passage that Christians did not invent. Um, Christians develop their ritual, pra Christian ritual practices out of the cultural contexts in which they find themselves. So particularly Jewish practices at Jesus' time that were um, marrying was clearly a two-part, two-stages ritual. You see that in Mary and Joseph, betrothal and marriage. And betrothal was already legally binding with the contract. But the other cultural elements that intervene as Christians try and put a Christian stamp on this human uh, uh, ritual are Roman imperial law, which um, insists on a clear consent of the partners. You still have that in, uh, in the US. Uh, legally um, and it's forced on churches, Eastern churches in particular, that might not have a formula of consent in their marriage rituals. But because in the US it's, oh how can I make that short, despite the much touted separation of church and state, most ministers in the US when they perform wedding function also as servants of the state and so are legally bound to incorporate consent into a wedding uh, ritual. So Eastern weddings in the US will include an element of consent for legal reasons even if their rituals, ecclesial rituals, don't contain that. Okay. Um, the rest is boring. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's ritually very rich, but the long and short is Christians ritualize this in terms of sacramental valence quite late. And a lot of the elements are simply taken over from the broader culture like this notion of consent, like a two-stage of betrothal or getting engaged and marrying, um, veiling. Um, mm. I'm going to leave it there, except to say, and Ruth Duck says that, in that in terms of ritual productions, um, we now have uh, churches, the UCC being one of them, that also have created rituals for the ending or the dissolution of a marriage. 
This doesn't come out of nowhere. It comes out of a phenomenal rise of um, marriages um, being ended and secular law uh, governing that as a, as a divorce. Some churches don't recognize that uh, what the law tells you your new status is. So legally you might be told you are divorced and your church might tell you we don't have that. You're not divorced, you, you are married, you continue to be married. And you can imagine the complications that emerge out of that. Okay, enough. Ordinations. Oh. I'm going to skip that. Uh, it happens. I mean, not that I skip things, but ordinations. They happen. They have a ritual pattern um, setting apart. Uh, the biblical, maybe this is important actually, <laughs> the, the biblical witness is complex and there are essentially in the earliest times three different patterns of leadership and ministry in Christians, Christian communities that are visible. One of them wins the historical day so that we now think this is it since Jesus' time. It's not. Um, Paul Bradshaw has written about this if you want to read uh, more. The three patterns essentially are, I, I'll just go through them quickly. Um, charismatic leadership by those with obvious spirit-inspired gifts. Second, a leadership by a host or patron of a household in which a community gathered the Christian community gathered. Important to remember that both in number one and number two, we have evidence of men and women falling into those categories. Charismatic leadership and um, head of household. The third one, emerges as a sort of loosely structured way of selecting and authorizing appropriate leadership in a community. And of course these three patterns that are visible to scholars who study this um, are not mutually exclusive. So you could be the head of a household, a woman, uh, like Lydia, you could be head of a household, of a household of a Christian community that gathers in your home, and you could at the same time have um, spirit-inspired gifts, have a charismatic uh, uh, leadership role. Um, the third pattern, though, some structured ways of selecting and authorizing leadership in the community is really what wins the day, although forms of charismatic leadership continue throughout history, we still see them uh, today. Um, that third part um, is in evidence early, clearly established by uh, the third century in uh, and certainly by the time Christian communities move into public spaces, late third century, early fourth century, that form of liturgical leadership is established. It's um, hierarchical and communal. So a bishop surrounded by presbyters, surrounded by deacons, and then what comes to be known as the laity, those not ordained. And how you become a bishop and a presbyter and a deacon um, it is a ritual process. 
and very much mappable as a rite of passage. Okay. The last rites of passage we'll deal with separately next week. A final note on the relationship of Christian worship to the broader uh, culture. Life cycle rituals are particularly imprinted with um, broader cultural developments because these life cycle rituals accompany people who live their lives in a particular culture, in a particular place and time, within particular cultural ways of naming and celebrating. And that means they are um, peculiarly open to broader cultural shifts. A couple of things to lift up in uh, particular here, uh, Ruth Duck goes into that, cultural shifts around who can legally, by the state, marry whom, impact ecclesial communities in a variety of ways, and do so quite quickly. Um, very different example, Hispanic communities um, have a very elaborate um, ritual of puberty, particularly for women, of course, the quinceañera. Uh, the Catholic Church in the U.S. now has created a ritual for a quinceañera that takes place in church and uh, uh, tries to Hmm. let the quinceañera become visible or imprinted with a Christian stamp rather than just a puberty rite. Which, yeah, enough said. Or not enough said, but I'm going to stop right there. Um, rituals surrounding pregnancy loss, stillbirth, birthing, um, think of rituals that have emerged in the culture, um, gender reveal parties, you know, that didn't exist in the Middle Ages either, <laughs> didn't exist until amniocentesis uh, came around, um, gender reveal parties. Probably by now some Christian community has created a ritual for that, it's not impossible it would just take five minutes uh, to do that. But so what I'm trying to say is there are ritual, there are developments in the broader culture and ritual developments that impact, shape, walk alongside Christian established rituals and often change the nature of these rituals, Christian rituals. But then all of the Christian rituals that we have mapped, as I said, didn't fall from heaven, but emerged out of the conversation with the broader culture already. So, which is, um, area for study? <laughs>